The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, rather, in South Africa. Still good morning here in the UK. And uh, this is our September edition of the Global Portfolio Update. A lot has happened in the last month. Not Lee, uh, me and Microsoft got boxing about uh, half an hour ago. And so as I was trying to save my PowerPoint presentation, which I always do for you, uh, the PowerPoint, well, Microsoft said, you can't save this one. Anyway, it's got something to do with the way um, it's a user error. And we know all about user errors at business. Um, we've been seeing lots of them in the last few days with our move across to the journal uh, and the, the new way that we're doing that. But anyway, uh, apologies for that. But I think that we're going to actually have a lot more fun by going through uh, the, the source documents. So rather than a sterile PowerPoint, I'm going to be taking you through the source documents today. But of course, in Johannesburg, as always, is my colleague, Stuart Lerman. Excellent. Thanks, Alec, as always, for coming through on this once a month uh, platform. Um, just quickly, before we get started, can the listeners just raise their hands if they can hear Alec clearly and see the presentation? Let me see if I've got some hands coming through. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, we do like to keep it conversation as well. If you've got little questions, drop down menu on the control panel on the right hand side. If you drop them in there, I'll pass them on to Alec as we run through things and hopefully keep it quite conversational as always. But Alec, I think that's it from my side. Um, let's get cracking. Indeed. Thank you, Stu. Uh, right. So just to go through the portfolio as it stands at the moment. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, it was launched in December 2014. The return since then, as you can see, it's virtually doubled. We started off with an amount of $200,000. We're now sitting at $390,000 in the last four years. In the last month, though, because that's why we do these monthly portfolios, uh, we've seen a good run in the price of Amazon. It picked up $47 in the last month. So that was on the plus side. On the negative side, a big retracement by Alphabet. That was down by $61 a share. Um, although when you're looking at the price now, when we bought it at $534 a share uh, back in December uh, 2014, a $61 reverse would have been 12%. Uh, today, a $61 reverse in a month is hardly even noticed, as you can see there, because of the price is at $1,180. Uh, then we had Apple, uh, which actually went up $2.50. There were two other big losses in the past uh, month, and that was as a direct consequence of the trade war, which was supposedly a phony war, and has now broken out into the open between China and the United States, rather we should say between the United States and China, because it's quite clear who the aggressor is here. We can talk a lot about the trade war later on, but let me just explain to you from my reading and from my uh, following of the situation what I'm seeing here. Over many years, China has been expanding its share of the global economy uh, from a very low base. The low base was created because of poor economic policies that were implemented during communism. It's, it's kind of the easiest way to destroy wealth is to introduce communism in a system, and that's been shown all over the world. In 1978, there was a decision by the uh, people of, uh, or the ruling party in China to change the economic system towards more of a market-driven one, and they've unleashed human potential in that country to the, the extent that the economy has grown over the last 40 years at a very rapid clip. In fact, if you were to take the global expansion in this period, most of it, or certainly over half of it, is due solely to the expansion in China. So that's the one part, the good part of it. The not so good part is that as China has expanded, it's become more muscular and it is concerned the vested interests. And the biggest of those vested interests is the United States, where 5% of the world's population own 25% of the world's wealth. Clearly, they have a president at the moment who doesn't like the fact that somebody else is also coming into the party. Uh, and he is most upset by the fact that the Chinese have been stealing, and there's no, there's no question about this, they've been stealing intellectual property. They uh, are, are not... Um, they haven't got any real problems about going in there and taking uh, information from other companies. And they've been trying to buy tech-heavy companies in the Western world 
which they can then take the information and replicate it. So the United States is upset. It says that China hasn't been following the rules, came in the, into the World Trade Organization with a promise uh, in 2001 that it was going to fix its malpractices. It, however, according to the United States, has not been doing so. And the United States says, well, it's now or never. Either we twist these guys' arms now to start operating fairly, or we're never going to have a chance again, because once they get bigger than us, uh, it, uh, we, it'll be impossible to, to force them to do this. On the other hand, the Chinese are saying that, uh, well, we aren't, we, we're doing the best we can to get our people to actually uh, play ball and not to steal property and uh, not to, uh, to operate unfairly. So you've got this very complicated situation. In the United States, though, the decision has been, we're going to show you China, and you've got, you've got a disruptive president in Donald Trump who's saying, I'm putting on 10% tariffs immediately, and those have been implemented, and I'll be adding, uh, and, and from the 1st of January, we'll be taking that up to 25%. Uh, so that is going to affect Chinese goods, it's going to affect the Chinese economy, but worst of all, it's going to affect emerging markets, it's going to affect company, uh, countries like South Africa, who've had this wonderful win from behind through a thing called quantitative easing, but now with quantitative easing ending, so money's being taken out of the system there, interest rates are rising, that means you haven't got this huge liquidity that can support you. But on the second hand, you've got China who now their economy is starting to get squeezed and that's going to, help, going to hurt in particular emerging markets. So that's kind of the background. When you bring that across to the portfolio, you'll see that the US focused stocks have not done that badly, except for Alphabet, except for Google. And that's got uh, um, a knock-on effect from some of the issues that have happened recently at that company. But you have a look at, in our portfolio, we have Alibaba and Tencent Holdings, both of whom have really had a rough month. In fact, I've had a rough couple of months and we'll go into the graphs in a little while to show you that. Tencent down $42 a share in this month and Alibaba was down $15 a share. Now, when you buy into companies, when you make an investment, although what Donald Trump and President Xi uh, in China are doing is interesting and it's fascinating and we've got to pay attention to it, although that is something that you must be aware of, it's not the reason why you buy or sell shares. Warren Buffett says he can't read the big picture. He stayed away from the big picture. What he does is he has to look at companies, he understands the companies, and then he will buy into the companies because of what he can see there is giving him a long-term benefit. And that's exactly what we've done as well. As far as my analysis is showing, uh, both Tencent and Alibaba are fantastic companies with a fantastic runway. There are a few flags waved at Alibaba in that Jack Ma, the chairman in the last month, said that he is going to be retiring off the board. Uh, that is never a good thing when a relatively young the chief executive and founder of a company says he's going off to go and do what Bill Gates is doing effectively, which is uh, philanthropy. And it, it would suggest to you that the really exciting time at Alibaba might be over. We are now seeing in our portfolio that Alibaba's share price is down 5%. But we bought into the company, not just because of Jack Ma, but because of the incredible uh, business that exists in Alibaba within China. In this new trade war situation, in this new environment that the world finds itself in, you have to ask yourself, are you going to continue to own shares in companies like Tencent and Alibaba? Have, are the best times not behind them? And that is a, a question that keeps occupying my mind. On the other hand, why we invested in those companies was because we like the underlying businesses. And China still has 1.3 billion people. It still has around 300 million people who need to move into the first world, uh, who are pretty unemployable at the moment or unemployed and are keen to get a stake of the first world. And they will be coming into the ambit of Tencent and Alibaba and 300 million is a, roughly three quarters of the population of the United States. So kind of putting it all into context and I hope those big pictures uh, give you an understanding of, of why we're structuring the portfolio this way and we haven't done anything. Uh, terribly dramatic in the past month. Uh, the, in RAND terms, uh, it's, it's very interesting, and I'll show you that in a moment, but the RAND uh, um, uh, performance, there we go, let's get that nice and clear for us. 
uh, the rand is exactly where it was a month ago. There you can see uh, we're at 14 rand 15 against the US dollar. And a month ago, we were at 14 rand 15 as well. I think that's the first time in the 46 months that we've been running the portfolio that that's happened. If you translate that into what's happened with the portfolio, as you can see, we now have a really nice round figure there of 150% profit in rand since we started four years ago. That works out to an annualized return of 39%. I means 39% a year. Um, if you can, if you could bank that, if you could say you could do that into the future, well, uh, you certainly wouldn't have to put your money anywhere else. The reality of life is that you do have up uh, or, or really good runs. We've been very fortunate. We've been in exponential companies. Uh, we're still keen on a number of other exponential companies that uh, we haven't put into the portfolio. But by the same token, uh, it might be the time now to uh, to 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 be a little bit uh, well, a, a little bit humble about the reality that we've gone up by 39% a year for the last four years and to anticipate it will continue at this level is uh, of course a pipe dream but we're there and the runs are on the board and from that perspective uh, the strategy of finding great companies and staying with them has actually paid off very well mostly due to Amazon as you can see from the next little table over here um, looking at the at the performance just look at that first. As you can see, the RAND cost uh, price was at 11 Rand 27 when we started off. It's now 14 Rand 15. So the RAND has depreciated by about a quarter in the last four years. But Amazon, which we bought at 3,700 Rand a share, is now sitting at nearly 28,000 Rand a share. So it's very, very difficult to not have a great performance if you had the good fortune of picking a stock like that. And I think the better fortune of actually not being tempted to take your profits in it. Alphabet has also been a fa fabulous, that's the old Google, has been a fabulous performer. And so has Apple. Although Apple had a bit of a bumpy start, uh, it has really come into its own. And I just want to stop for a minute and tell you about something that I saw at Apple last month, which, which quite in, uh, uh, illustrated exactly what this company is up to. When Steve Jobs started the company initially, he was a very young man and he didn't really uh, have a whole lot of organizational dynamics installed. He was quite a, um, as, as one would expect, a successful 20 year old with a big ego uh, kind of person. He was, he was quite difficult to deal with. You can read all about this in Walter Isaacson's biography, Steve Jobs, one of the, one of the must read books um, that if you haven't read it yet, put it on your, on your, uh, list, then I can assure you it's one that you find very difficult to put down. But he then was kicked out, uh, and that was a consequence of a board of directors bringing in a guy called John Scully. Scully had been the chief executive of Coca Cola, uh, sorry, Pepsi Cola, and he was brought in to run um, Apple. And he, after a little while, initially he was Jobs' mentor, but after a little while, the two of them didn't get on that well. And Jobs, who was uh, all of 30 years old, was then booted out. He came back many years later, chastened, more humble, more, more savvy, and he has transformed Apple into the company that it is today. But he also installed a lot of very interesting things. And when you talk to people at Apple who work for the organization, they're fiercely loyal, and they are uh, pretty secretive in telling what's happening. As a consequence, every September when they release their new phones and, the, and their new products, uh, the media is always scrambling around trying to find out what they are and very rarely do they get the inside track. I was at, an Apple, at the Apple store in Regent Street here in London uh, a few weeks ago. And as I walked in, there were 400 people roughly who were clapping and shouting and they had this long, um, row, which was like if you if you remember uh, at weddings, sometimes a, a famous sports person, sportsman or sportswoman gets married, they would have this guard of honour. Uh, I can remember from a cricket point of view, they'd stand up there with the cricket bats, and then the couple would walk through. Well, it was like a guard of honour, this long row, and this guy came back and it was coming down, and they stopped and they hugged. Uh, he'd get an occasional hug, and they cheered and whatever. This must have gone on for about ten minutes, and the customers just stood around watching. It was quite a, quite a spectacle. 
I spoke to a few of the Apple staffers afterwards and I said, what, what is that? What was that? And they said, everybody who leaves Apple, everybody who leaves the store, not just the store, but any part of Apple gets that kind of a send off. Even if they're going to work for Samsung, the, the, uh, uh, the rival, they get the same send off. It's part of the culture that's been instilled by Steve Jobs and it exists today. And in fact, if anything has been amplified, that if somebody works for Apple, they're part of the family today. And if they leave, they don't become part of, the, they don't suddenly uh, no longer become part of the family, remain consistent, send them on their way with a cheer, uh, give them the, the best possible um, goodbye. And a consequence of this is that people tend to stay at Apple and they tend to have a very low turnover. It's one of those, one of those unusual things, one of those little uh, pieces in the wind that I thought I'd share with you because it reaffirms again what an incredible company this is. Although it is the, uh, the, the most valuable company in the world uh, and it is highly corporatized as you have to be when you've got hundreds of thousands of people who work for you and you're worth a trillion dollars. But on the other hand, they've got these very strong cultural issues that continue to reaffirm the Apple success story. Nice story. Anyway, uh, the S&P 500 index, the Vanguard in the last month, uh, that was virtually unchanged. And that is what we have there is we invested in an index which reflects the underlying weightings of the American stock market. The S&P 500 is the top 500 shares listed in America. And as you can see, overall market up 76%. Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Warren Buffett's company is slightly outperformed the S&P 500 index. And that was when we structured the portfolio, we did that purposefully. We said, well, look, we think the RAND's gonna fall. We think the American market's gonna do well. Let's have a big chunk of our portfolio in the American market. And then we do some stock picking outside of that. And hopefully we find companies that outperform. In fact, that we find all the companies that we invest in outperform. Of course, that's, that's, uh, that's a very difficult uh, ask, but we have been very uh, fortunate in having Amazon and App and uh, Alphabet and Apple who have outperformed. But if you, if you were just to put your money into the American stock market, into the S&P 500 index four years ago, you would in rands have made 76%, of which 26% of that is an improvement from the rand dollar. So it gives you an understanding of, of uh, that was, uh, it, was a, it was a strategy that we took, the big strategy, and it worked. Microsoft has outperformed the market. We've only bought it relatively recently. Uh, Tencent is still in front, as is Alibaba because of the RAND, because we bought in at a, at a um, uh, or the RAND has weakened since we bought in. Um, but both of those are now down to, as you can see, single digits. And then as far as um, the most recent purchase, Adobe is concerned, that's been a very good purchase for us already. And uh, that is the, the outline of, if you like, of, um, of where the portfolio is today and how it has performed. Stu? Thanks, Alec. Um, you mentioned the runs on the board, so we'll stick with the cricketers with us. Um, unfortunately, the crowd is very silent, so we don't have any questions at the moment. Um, maybe it's because our northerly neighbours in Zimbabweans are coming to town for a cricket series, but unfortunately, there are no questions, Master. So okay. We do encourage conversation. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. So, uh, well, in the last month, the portfolio has actually gone down a little bit because of those knocks from Alphabet, Tencent, and Alibaba. So the value of the portfolio in rands has gone from 5.4 million rand to 5.365 million rand with the downs being offset by amazon.com. Let's talk about some of the specifics. And, uh, and for those of you who haven't yet discovered the Wall Street Journal, there's a nice opportunity. I can actually take you through how it works. Okay, in fact, what, what I'll do is just go right to the beginning because you get your subscription to the Wall Street Journal through Business, business News Premium subscription. So you buy the Business News Premium and you get, as a result, as packaged into that, the Wall Street Journal comes, um, which ordinarily would cost you, I think the subscription is $28 a month. So it gives you an idea of what a fantastic uh, value the Business News Premium is. And there at the top, you can see my name is there. Every subscriber from Business News, since we changed the setup last month, uh, sorry, last week, um, now will be will be greeted by WSJ by name, um, and that also means that you're now a fully fledged uh, subscriber to the Wall Street Journal. Whereas in the past, 
our subscribers came in, they didn't have this thing. They didn't say Alec Hogg there. They came in as uh, as a an anonymous Biz News uh, subscriber. Anyway, let's get into the issue. So to 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 get to the data section, uh, the best thing I the way I find is you uh, click the search button, and we're going to start off with the rand, uh, and there's the South African rand against the US dollar. Uh, you, it has a page like this for every single uh, piece of data. Very, very strong stuff. And you can see in the past month, the RAND has appreciated really nicely. Uh, and you have a look there, it was at 15.43 on the 5th of September, and it's improved all the way down to 14.10. Oh, I see it's picked up 10, it's picked up five cents um, since we, uh, since I put all the data together. But what I want to show you as far as the RAND is concerned, is what's happened in the last year. Since uh, Ramaphosa, you can see it quite clearly, uh, since he came in around here, Stu, can, you can see there uh, quite, well, let's just go back to November, because that's when the suggestion was that uh, Ramaphosa might be elected. Up to that point, the bookmakers made odds on favorite Mrs. Zuma to continue with the uh, Zuma legacy. And you can see we got to 14 Rand 47 against the US dollar. Then it started improving and improving all the way. And there it was on the 18th. Uh, I wanted to get the exact date for you. Uh, the 18th, there it is. The day of the announcement, the improvement went from 1309 to 1275. So the Rand picked up 25 cents on the announcement that Ramaphosa had indeed been elected. The good, the, the, the smart money was already following him. And then as Ramaphoria set in, so did the strength of the RAND getting down, to, as you can see there, at 11 RAND 55 uh, at one point in time. So what's happened since then? Well, we've had a couple of things. The one thing is that Ramaphoria has certainly waned. Part of the reason for this has been the problems that have come through through the expropriation of land um, without compensation. That is a strategy, a policy that has been uh, sensationalized is something that the rest of the world really doesn't like because the minute you start going along that road, it puts all kinds of question marks against other uh, property rights in a country. So that's the first thing. But that has been kind of muted. Here's where the problems really began. And that is on the, as you can see there, the 5th of June, um, when emerging market issues started coming to the fore. So between the, 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 the February and June, Ramaphoria did start to wane a little. Uh, expropriation without compensation was weighing on people's minds. But suddenly uh, in June, the whole emerging market issues started bursting into the limelight. And the trouble with a country like South Africa is that it is a small country, it's got under half a percent of global GDP. It has a, it has a very open economy. More than 50% of South Africa's economy is either imports or exports. So what happens in the rest of the world has a very big impact on what happens in South Africa. But more than that, it's one of the fragile five. And what that means is that there are five countries that have been identified by international investors. In fact, I think it started off with Goldman Sachs. And those five countries, the Fragile Five as they put them, have always been put into a different category. The reason why they're called the Fragile Five is because they are countries that are running big current account deficits. They're countries that are running significant current uh, budget deficits as well. And, what, and they are emerging markets. So, what all of that means is that they need money from elsewhere in the world. And as long as the rest of the world is excited about the prospects for members of, of those, uh, of the Fragile Five, then their currencies will hold up. The minute that they start falling out of bed or they start, uh, start worrying about it, uh, those currencies take a knock. And as a consequence of the currencies taking a, a, um, a reverse, it then uh, is, it, it has a direct impact on stock markets um, and economic growth prospects because if your currency is falling, it means it's more difficult to attract capital into the country. What happened, what has been happening for much of this year is that Turkey, which is one of the fragile five, 
has, and one of the leading emerging markets, it has a autocratic leader, almost like, in fact, I'd love to show you this graph. Let's overlay it. Um, uh, it's almost like, it's nearer. Uh, uh, th th they, those poor people have got, <coughs> Turkish Lira, US dollar, that should do us. Yep. Uh, they have got Erdogan. They've got their own Zuma. And as you can see in the last year, the Rand and the Turkish Lira did about the same up until April, May. And then Erdogan started to go a little rogue. Uh, he made his son-in-law the Minister of Finance. He then started arresting thousands, tens of thousands of political dissidents. He had an election which people looked at and thought, well, it was about on a, on a um, credibility scale of the recent one in Zimbabwe and so on and so forth. And as you can see, the Turkish lira has been hammered. Now, for a period of time, the RAND was able to divert from the Turkish lira. We don't have Zuma running the country anymore. We've now got Ramaphosa, whereas Turkey has still got their Zuma in, in control. And you can almost say to yourself, had South Africa voted differently or had the ANC voted differently in December, what's happened to the Turkish lira would be exactly where the South African rand has gone. So sometimes you have to have a look at what the reality is in the international arena, and then you will appreciate exactly why it was such an important vote at that time. But just going back to the rand itself, um, you can see there that the depreciation of the currency really picked up in early August. Uh, and this was as the emerging market crisis started to, to gather momentum, Argentina and Turkey. And it has improved, the currency has improved since um, late August, early September, as those fears on the emerging market seem to have settled down. One of the big issues that happened was when Argentina got into trouble, immediately it jacked up interest rates. By jacking up interest rates to 60%, it encouraged money to come back into the country that stabilized the currency. In Turkey, the Erdogan said, uh, interest rates are the great evil. I'm not going to increase interest rates ever. Well, the ever lasted about two weeks where the international markets were um, hitting the Turkish lira so hard that there his son-in-law, the finance minister, had to actually go forward and increase interest rates in that country as well. So that's also starting to stabilize the Turkish situation. That's why the RAND has uh, reacted to the degree that it has. Stu? Excellent, thanks, Ale. So when there's no questions, we always need to check. So there was a little technical issue. So I've got quite a few questions that's come through. So the crowd is quite rowdy. Um, just quickly from Benjamin, Alec, he wants to know just an idea on the, your view on the oil supply and the Brent price going forward, if you have one. Okay, well, there we go. Now you see the, the uh, I suppose, the good, good news because we've got this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brent crude oil daily. Hmm. Uh, which one should we go with? Uh, Brent oil fund. I wonder if this is going to help us. Uh, we should rather just go with the oil price. Okay. Here we go. I think this is going to uh, give us a very good understanding of, of, of what's been going on with the oil price. It really has been a, um, a surprise to everybody. The initial idea about oil or the view about oil was that when the Americans came in through their fracking, that there would be a endless supply of oil going into the market, particularly after $60 a barrel. But for reasons that are best known to the people who are dealing with the, the trading of these currencies, um, the oil price has actually given everybody a, a huge surprise. Um, this is not, this is showing a, a, something different. So I'm going to have to just try Brent crude oil. There we go. My apologies, $81. Aha, there we go. Okay, so we can have a look at this. And I, I really urge you to use the Wall Street Journal um, data. As you can see, it's quick and it, uh, it, it, it's fascinating insight. But there you can see the way that the oil price has, has completely um, broken all uh, forecasts. Uh, in fact, if we go back five years, that shows it even more aggressively. 
So there we had uh, May, mid 2014, uh, where it was at $100 a barrel. At that time, uh, even go back further, at that time there, the anticipation was that it was going to just go higher and higher. They used to talk about something called peak oil, you might remember, uh, and they didn't know where that was. And then as fracking came in and the, the world economy started uh, to get a little bit more nervous about what China growth would be like, we saw the decline in the oil price to uh, a, a bottoming out there in uh, February 2016 at $46. Since then, it's almost doubled. So where to from here? The big question mark is the trade war. The trade war, uh, trade wars are not good for global economic growth. And global economic growth is critical for the oil price. The oil price is determined uh, it, it's it's got a direct it's directly comparable to the way that the the global economy is expanding. So at these levels, you've got to be saying to yourself, from a long term view, with all the risks that are built into the system, it is probably not a place where you'd be putting your money right now. Especially because we haven't seen the additional supply that could come into the market certainly from fracking in the US and other parts of the world, you've got even bigger reserves than the Americans have in shale gas, which could also come in. So there are, there are many moving parts on this, but my sense about, about oil, when you look at it from a longer term, is that you've probably had the run and uh, from here onwards, it is getting an, an increasingly risky bet. What this is also telling us though, is that the market, Mr. Market is saying he doesn't think the trade war is going to have any impact. And that's quite an interesting point because when you read Donald Trump's book, The Art of the Deal, his whole strategy, his whole negotiating strategy is push the envelope, push the envelope beyond. And then you get your, your, your uh, counterpart will come back, uh, will, will um, make you drop your uh, demands, but you would have got a lot further than if you'd gone in with a reasonable offer in the first instance. So by him saying 10% tariff plus 25% from January, um, maybe that is going to have the desired effect. There are many, including Nura Rabini, and I'd, I'd urge you to go and listen to the podcast that I did uh, last week on uh, the, the whole trade war. He said there are so many better ways to do these things, to negotiate these things, than to, to take the full frontal approach that Trump has done his suggestion, Rubini's suggestion, is that the countries, there are other countries in the world, if they wanted to force China to play fair by the trade rules, should have just got together and in that way um, squeezed the Chinese uh, to, to be um, acting fairly. Uh, you didn't have to do what Trump is doing at the moment. The risks of this are very high. But the market is telling us that the, uh, the trade war is not actually going to happen. That's what it's still telling us. Is Mr. Market right? Only time will tell. Thanks, Alec. PJ just wants to know, given the good run of the portfolio, is it still viable to invest in it as it is at the moment? PJ, my suggestion, and here's, here's a, uh, 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 it's good to pick up the Amazon.com um, share price because that gives you a, a good understanding. Remember, we bought in here at that point. Yeah. Um, we were a little bit lower than that, actually. Three. Uh, we were at in December, which was okay. It doesn't. Um, anyways, around it was around three thirty-seven. So it's gone up to went over two thousand um, dollars. Now your question has to be: uh, Are you needing to take um, profits? Is it uh, too high in the short term? The question always for me on investing is that you have to remember why did you buy the company's shares in the first place? In our portfolio, most of the portfolio is there because we're, we, we're doing the inter, we are doing the uh, exponential better. And I'll just show you that to go, just go into that in, in, in a little bit of detail if you don't mind. Amazon is an exponential company. It's a company that is growing at 40 to 50% a year in both, uh, well, 30% in sales, uh, 40 to 50% in profits, although they could switch that on as much as they wanted to. But when you have a compounded growth rate of 30%, it's extraordinary how quickly you 
have the power of compound interest actually working in your favor. Would I be selling Amazon.com? Well, the reason we bought it was because it is an exponential company and the business model that they're employing is irresistible. Remember, you have got an absolute obsession for customers. That is what uh, Bezos has, has been every year in his uh, shareholders report, uh, his report to shareholders from the chairman. Since 1997, when they listed, he talks about this obsession for customers. How do we go back to day one? Um, in other words, like we're freshly starting again today. And how do we treat customers most fairly? That's an irresistible model when you've got others who are trying to uh, squeeze out the maximum amount of profit that they can from every unit of kilojoules or bag of kilojoules that walks into the store or comes across their path. Alphabet, Google completely dominates the internet uh, as far as search is concerned. And as far as advertising is concerned, it has a model which is a lot more sustainable than Facebook's. Because what Alphabet does, what Google does, it shares with people like us at Biz News the revenue that is generated from its advertising. Facebook doesn't. Facebook keeps all of its advertising revenues. So as a consequence, Facebook doesn't have the partners and Facebook is really, a, it's, of course, it's got Instagram and, um, uh, and Facebook itself and YouTube. So it's got, it's got really good, uh, sorry, YouTube's with Google. Um, uh, Alphabet has got, uh, Facebook has got really good products, but on the other hand, it is using the information on the people who, who make the products great. Uh, and why is it not sharing the money with them, the, the money it's generating from them? There's, there's those questions. Alphabet doesn't have that question. So I'm still very happy to be with it. Apple, I've said consistently that this is an exponential company because they haven't yet started to really uh, tap into the underlying value of the ecosystem. There are more than a billion Apple devices out in the marketplace. And those billion devices plug into an ecosystem that is, uh, includes iTunes and includes um, all, any number of Apple products. If you are a part of the Apple family, as I've been since 1985, you just, the best place in the world for you is the Apple store. So those are the realities there, which are not uh, built into the share price yet. The share price is still looking at what our iPhone sales doing rather than looking at the, at the entire uh, chain. So how could you sell any of those three companies? I, I, I can't see any conceivable reason for doing so. Uh, Microsoft has got the reason we went into Microsoft. Those of you who've been around for a while will remember they had transformed their business model from one where you would buy the products every year uh, to one where you now buy it online and you have a subscription model and it, it just automatically renews. It's the most powerful business model on earth. And since I'm, uh, Microsoft and Adobe have got a similar thing where they've moved from, an off from a different model to a subscription model, both of those companies are magnificently well set with great products, uh, even though sometimes uh, the user error is high. Uh, but both of those companies, why would you want to sell them? Uh, and then Tencent and Alibaba, there are question marks there. Uh, because of what's happening with the trade war in China. Uh, certainly those shares have, have fallen. But if you look at what we saw a little a moment earlier on the oil price, um, that's telling you that the trade war is not going to be either not going to happen or it's not going to be as serious as we all worried. Or uh, that's what Mr. Market is saying. In these individual stocks, it's almost like investors in America are taking insurance and saying, okay, uh, let's rather not uh, push the envelope too far on both of these. Uh, either if we've been in it for a long time, it's better to look at the US dollar prices on those, uh, then we should take profits or uh, they could be hurt. Now, remember, if, the tra if there's some breakthrough in discussions on, tra on the, the trade front, those stocks will be the biggest beneficiaries, Alibaba and Tencent. And my sense is that you really bought them because of the potential of the Chinese market anyway. So long story short, no. I wouldn't be selling and certainly I'd be happy to buy. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. Um, I'm not sure how correct this is. Anthony Rodevach says in the business US portfolio, I think that's the Easy Equities one, you sold Microsoft and Alibaba and purchased Net Twitter Netflix. No, I'm not I didn't. sure. Yeah. No, okay. So, yeah. 
I know you're looking at Twitter, but you haven't done anything on Twitter. We've, looked at, we've looked at both Twitter and Netflix, um, but we have not sold them. We have not, so we've not made any changes there. Um, cool. Certainly I haven't, and maybe somebody else says, but no, they're not allowed to. No, we haven't done that. But I'll tell you what, let's, uh, yeah, no, we can't. We, but no, we haven't, we haven't sold them. Cool. Um, Benjamin just wants to know the other, we've mentioned two now, but other exponential shares you've identified which you could add to the portfolio. Well, there they are. And let's have a look at both of them. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I really, really like Twitter. I think that Jack Dorsey is doing a, a phenomenal job. He hasn't got, not everybody's a, a fan. Um, I'm a fan, uh, a big fan. I think they've got an extraordinary business. Um, and the share price is now starting to look very, very uh, enticing again. We're down at uh, $29. See, what happened here was that uh, this is after the quarterly results of Twitter. They were $44. They came all the way down to 31 And it's kind of lost, they've kind of lost interest. And Dorsey, you might recall, uh, was in Congress a couple of weeks ago, along with Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook. Uh, Cheryl is far more polished. Dorsey came across uh, not as well as as uh, as you might expect, but for me that's a, that's a big bull point. I like I like my chief executives not to be too polished. Um, ever since reading Good to Great by Jim Collins, that it 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 reinforced in my head that the best chief executives are the guys who are below the radar that you don't know about. You know, for years and years and years, Warren Buffett was below the radar. Just couldn't help it when he started getting 30, 40,000 people coming to AGMs. Uh, but even now, he only talks to Betty, Becky Quick. That's it. One journalist uh, from CNBC. He, he doesn't, he could, he could spend his life if he wanted to uh, in the media, but that's not his game. Dorsey is, is, is similarly, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur. He started Twitter, he left. Uh, he's back there now, understanding, almost like a Steve Jobs story, understanding that it, it needs to be sustainable. The next set of quarterly results, uh, I don't think you're going to find a, a, a similar disappointment as you had in the last set. The, the, it's a phenomenal, a phenomenon, Twitter. I mean, where else in the world do you get the president of the United States, who is your, um, your marketing agent almost? Uh, it they are starting to make money from it. They have this huge uh, user base. Nobody has managed to find anything to disrupt Twitter. It keeps growing, it keeps expanding, and it keeps uh, delivering the goods for its consumers. So I really like Twitter. And if there was one that I would think of adding to the portfolio now because of its exponential nature, it would be Twitter. The other one that uh, we've looked at for a, 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 a for a long time uh, is Netflix, and again, there's a there's a phenomenal model here that Netflix has got. It's it's called the the networking, I suppose, not surprisingly, uh, the network model. And here, Netflix, the time to have bought was after the quarterlies, uh, when the share price, as you can see there, came down from four hundred and eighteen dollars. 334 it actually got down to 322 dollars. Um, it's now gone back up to 377. I guess that's where we should have bought into Netflix, and I, I was sorely tempted at the time, but it was very hard to see what we were going to drop out of the portfolio uh, to bring it in. And it was also coming off a, uh, a set of, of uh, financial results that we aren't too sure yet. Whereas Twitter, you know, it was a one off, you know, that they made big changes to get rid of uh, dormant accounts on Twitter. And investors or Mr. Market didn't like that because he saw the sheer numbers dropping. On Netflix, they didn't, they didn't hit their targets. The problem for Netflix as well is that they, it's a bit like Tesla. Netflix is spending much more than it's getting in. It's investing. A, for every Tesla car you buy today, shareholders are subsidizing thousands and thousands of dollars for the production of that car. So actually we should all be going out there buying Tesla cars, but not Tesla shares. So it's almost like you've got a, a, a Model S, it's Tesla what, burning two billion a year. So you've got a Model S car, uh, it, every one that they sell, there, there's uh, quite a few thousand dollars in there that shareholders are subsidizing the price with. And it's a fantastic vehicle. The problem is what happens 
when you bring that down to a point where you want to sell it to make a profit on it. Not so easy if you're talking about a product. The difference with a, a Google or an Amazon is it's a service. So with a Google, there's no additional cost. You've got the scale. It's all on the internet. It's all free. With Tesla, you've got to make a new, you've got to make a new car. Netflix is a bit like Tesla in that respect. They are burning cash, billions of, of, of dollars a year to produce incredible content that keeps people like me signing up for $7 or £7.99. And at £7.99, I don't notice it. It's a couple of cups of coffee. Um, whereas um, Netflix, is, it, it, got, it seems necessary for it to keep that circle going by investing £100 million in a series like The Crown. So Netflix, you've you got to look at it and you say, it's, it's a fantastic model. The more people they get, the, the, the greater the revenue stream, et cetera. But the big question mark there is, what happens when they start switching off that huge investment into new product? A little bit like what happens to Tesla when it hasn't got the money to subsidize its products anymore? Will it be able to sell at a higher price? Will Netflix be able to sell at a higher price? Now, all the numbers I've, I've looked at suggest it's, suggests it can. If they were to increase the price in the United States, for instance, by just a couple of dollars a, um, a month, um, the numbers I saw were that if, they on, if they're looking at the moment, the most popular account is $10.99 in the United States. But one third of their audience are actually on a premium product at $13.99. So uh, where they're bouncing against or what Netflix compares against is the US movie ticket, which costs about $15. So as long as you, the thought is as long as Netflix can be below the cost of a US, of a, of a movie ticket in, in the United States, then it's got a, a compelling proposition. What I would like to see is Netflix increasing its subscription uh, prices, its subscription costs, and then have a look at that to how does that impact the number of subscribers. If you get an increase in the subscription cost and no decline or no substantial decline in the number of subscribers, which I suspect is what's going to happen, then you know that Netflix has got the potential to continue to invest in the product uh, in the way that it has, but to get back the, the money from, uh, from the people who are, are buying it. So it's, a, it's, it's, as with everything, there are always two sides to every story, but Netflix at the moment is still, you, you almost need a little bit more information on it to be able to be completely convinced in the same way as we were with, uh, with Apple, uh, Amazon, and Alphabet. Thanks, Alec. Duncan's got an interesting point. He says, would you sell a portion of a stock rather than the whole thing as you have been doing? It could help with things like a Twitter purchase. Duncan, it's a good question. I guess the issue there is, do you know or do you believe that the company that you're investing in is going to outperform the company that you're already in? Uh, so uh, that's the first thing. And secondly, is that the best way to do it? My, my sense is always ride your winners. Don't, don't get off your winners. Don't even decline, uh, reduce the, the, the stake you have in your winners. Because it was a very, very good idea, very good reason for you to buy them in the first place. You did a lot of research, a lot of homework. I mean, look at Apple. I looked at Apple for two years before buying it for the portfolio. I've been watching Netflix for three years. And eventually, a time will come when all of the pieces, including the price, get together. Apple, of course, we were, we were early. We bought it, I think, 120, and it went down to 90. Uh, it's, it's, you can never time your your, your purchases perfectly that's that's for the miracle makers that's for the guys much smarter than me but when it comes to the work the energy the effort that you've done in the company remember we've had companies in this portfolio that have also been well researched but there have been a fundamental change in the way or the 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 information that we had initially um, and or, and why we liked it to what then happened subsequently Novo Nordisk is a very good example of that. Uh, IBM, another good example. Barclays, another good example. In both Novo Nordisk and Barclays' example, those two companies 
had issues at a governance level that really worried me. And if you get that, if you get the chief executive of a company, like at Barclays, who, who wants to find a whistleblower, a guy who's blown a whistle on a pal of his, who's on the board or, or some senior member of the, uh, of, of, of the company, and he, he, he's, he's going into the business, abusing his power, trying to expose this guy, and he finally gets exposed. And, and what happens? He has to give up his bonus. He doesn't get fired. You've got to ask yourself, how's the governance in that place? It, it just isn't right. Um, a similar thing with Novo Nordisk, where they were uh, boomed as, the, as the, the chief executive, I think, two years in a row, one best chief executive in the world, for, in the world from Harvard Business Review. And, you don't, and then the next year, they have a profit warning, and he's fired, and, and so on and so forth. So there was quite a lot of stuff that went, in, went on at Novo Nordisk, which, which wasn't entirely honest. And that's really what it's about. You want to have, you want to have people you can, whose business model you can understand, people you can trust, people who are consistent. Larry and Sergi at, at Google, they still are the, the driving forces there. Uh, you got the same thing with Bezos, same thing with Warren Buffett at, at Berkshire Hathaway. You know, would you give your money to these guys any day of the week? Uh, there are others, and um, they get exposed in time. We know the Yosta story, for example. But there are others who, who you're not so happy about. Uh, Travis Kavelnik uh, at, at um, Uber, uh, a good example. And uh, it, it doesn't mean you stay with the stock forever. But I like Dorsey. I like Dorsey at Twitter. I like what they're doing at Twitter. And as a consequence of that, um, it's almost a, a feeling that of the two, I'd rather go with that one. Excellent. Thanks. And I've got two questions just to close off with quickly. Um, Steve Bacchus wants to know if you've looked at a company called NIO. It's a Chinese electric car company that recently listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay. Uh, I remember reading about it. I don't know enough uh, NIO. There we go. Oh, okay. Uh, lithium batteries. There we go. Uh, see, it had a, had a pretty spectacular start. Eh? 660 to sure, 1160. It's come back uh, 750. I haven't looked at it. Uh, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, but I'm afraid not. Uh, something that is quite interesting, quite um, while we're talking about this or having a look at this, you can get all the information you want. Okay, I'll just put NIO in there. And as you can see, here's in the Wall Street Journal um, Global lithium iron market grows. So anything relating to NIO, there it is. Maybe facing the same issues as Tesla, according to analysts. Uh, China's high powered Tesla rival is short on gas and so on and so forth. So NIO is obviously, a, it's another Tesla. There it is. There's a picture of the, um, wow, amazing looking car, isn't you? Imagine driving that car down, uh, down the main road in, in uh, Joburg. Thank you. It'd be interesting cool. given Tesla, Tesla want to build a factory in China the you know, with regards to competition that side. But anyway, very interesting. Hmm. Lovely looking car, sure. Yeah, very so good. it's, it, I think the point about that and, and, uh, and the point about Tesla as well is that it, it, I'm very happy we're out of Tesla uh, and I'm very happy that we, we were fortunate enough to make money for the portfolio in, in Tesla. But uh, you can see Elon Musk has got his fans. Eh? Uh, every time that, that he does something crazy like uh, smoking pot on a, on a podcast, uh, that, was the, that was the big move. Remember, um, there it came. It was on the on the uh, 7th of August, where, there's the day. Uh, on the 7th of August, it went up to $379. That was when he said uh, that taking it private from 341 to 379. It then collapsed thereafter to 263. Now, this is not the kind of uh, stock that you want to be invested in if you like sleeping at night. Alex, just to close off, I, know it, I kept this one for last because it's a question on NASPAS. I know you always get your, you get asked your views on NASPAS. Um, so I don't know if you want to just end off with that for Benjamin. Well, I do. And, and it's, thanks, Benjamin, because you can see uh, Wall Street Journal has also got all the South African shares. So, uh, and, and really, I, I'll, I'll show you in a minute the, just a, a, a taste of, of the kind of stuff that it's got. But NASPAS has been bumping along um, for the last year. Now, what you might remember 
uh, happened was that NASPASS, uh, because it is, uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to sort of put 10 cent on it as well, uh, because the biggest part of the NASPASS board, for, well, more than 100% of NASPASS's value is made up through its investment in 10 cent. Uh, whenever 10 cent falls, NASPASS tends to fall as well. Um, but around about uh, nine months ago, in fact, it was December last year, NASPERS had a uh, investment roadshow in New York where it got together for the first time, it brought investment analysts from the United States, from Wall Street uh, together to try and say to, to these guys, look, yes, we are listed in South Africa and we're going to stay listed in South Africa, but uh, we are a cheap way into Tencent um, that we understand, but actually, we're a, we've got a fabulous business. We've got a, um, we, we're one of the, the global leaders in food delivery. I see today in the Financial Times of London, uh, there's a story about uh, apps uh, exploding in food delivery. NASPASS is in there. It's, it, it dominates that market in many, many countries around the world. Um, so even in, the, in India, where it's sold out on Flipkart, it's still got a big slug of that market. It's got the biggest company in Europe uh, in that field, which is uh, called Delivery Hero. I can actually, while, we, while we're talking about it, I can take you into, uh, into that uh, share price as well, because I think that's really worth looking at. Delivery Hero is a uh, listed, is, oh, oh, got the wrong one. I clicked on the wrong one, I'm afraid. Um, so let's just go into the Frankfurt market. Sorry about that. Um, and NASPASS is one of the original shareholders in Delivery Hero. Um, and it has now, it's, it is now a very, very substantial business. Okay, there's Frankfurt's. Okay. Since it's listing, Delivery Hero hasn't done a whole lot. Well, I suppose you can't, you can't complain. You've gone from 33, 33 euros to 42 euros in, uh, when was that? in the last year. But uh, it, it just reflects that the kind of business that NASPAS is, is not, it's not a one-trick pony. Uh, it's got a market cap, uh, there's about 8 billion uh, euros in Delivery Hero. Um, and, NASPASS has got many of these investments in different parts, uh, in different sectors that have not been appreciated until recently. And as you can see here at this graph, which shows NASPASS against Tencent, that since, when was that, June this year, when Tencent, the blue one, has been falling, NASPASS has actually held up relatively well. And there's no, there's no impact there of the exchange rate on either of those. Um, we're just looking at NASPASS has actually risen by 8.5% when Tencent has fallen by 3.5%. So NASPASS, if you like, has outperformed Tencent by 12%. That is the beginning of something that the NASPASS team have been working on really hard. They remember we're sitting at one stage at a 40% discount to the underlying value of just what they owned in Tencent. Now, how can you go wrong long term by buying a dollar's worth of, of, of goods for 60 cents? It gives you a massive margin of safety. And this is showing you how, how that margin of safety has come to the party. What I would urge you to do on NASPERS is to try and look outside of Tencent and see what else NASPERS has been doing. My thesis is that they have done extraordinarily well in their other bets. Their internal, their, their rate of return on those investments has been superb. Uh, they haven't made any really bad ones for a while. Um, and most of the areas that they've identified are now starting to come into the mainstream as, hey, this is a place we should be. Home delivery of, of uh, food or fast food, for instance. They're there. Classified advertising, they're there. Um, and, and that's really the, uh, I guess, what you're buying in at NASPERS. So you've got this underlying base of, uh, of Tencent, which is, although it's declined, it, it's still buying it at a, at a huge discount. 
And then you've got all these other interesting bits and pieces that are in there. Is the multi-choice unbundling going to make a big difference to NASPERS in Montsus's life? Of course not. It's tiny in the grand uh, scheme of things. But it is going to make NASPERS less dependent on South Africa, which is not a bad thing in this uh, day and age when emerging markets are coming in for a bit of, ish, a, a bit of wind from, from the front. And secondly, it'll take them out of that political environment where they really don't want to be involved. The last thing Chris Becker wants to be worrying about is newspaper reports that suggest that he's being bribing or somehow giving an incentive to some politician so that multi-choice retains its DSTV license and stuff like that, which came along last year. Those allegations, I looked into them, I went into great depth on them. And the, 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 the scuttlebutt that was written and was, was alleged around that is just almost, it's, it's beyond the pale in many respects. And as a consequence of that, you can be pretty sure that the NASPERS team are now quite happy that multi-choice is going to be doing its own thing and they won't be distracted by that in the future because it's a tiny part of the business. I mean, you're talking fractional couple of percentage points, um, whereas they've got very big fish to fry. And in my opinion, they're frying them particularly well. Excellent. Thanks. And a nice way to end off there. I think it's been, a, as usual, always an insightful hour of insight from yourself. Thanks a lot. I, I'm just interested uh, um, whether uh, the, the, uh, the community who, who watching this are actually finding this more interesting where we can move across to different uh, stocks or the the stock standard uh, presentation, the PowerPoint presentation. I mean, do you do you feel just just give us a thumbs up if you feel that uh, this is the a, a better way to go uh, than than the normal process of doing the a PowerPoint? Is it working? Got a, few, up? got a lot of hands coming through, Alex. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that, 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 that thumbs up or hands up, but I'm sure it's it's it's, it's positive. There's a lot of hands coming through. I, I, I you know, it, I mean, it didn't. It uh, I've been doing the PowerPoint presentation, but sometimes it it just feels a lot more vibrant and alive when we can go through, and we have got such incredible information that's available to us. So let's do this in future. I will obviously put the portfolios together and we can go through the portfolios and then we can have a look at the, at the live numbers uh, on how the various uh, stocks have performed. And uh, just one last thing before we go, I wanted to show this to you as well um, on the Wall Street Journal. It'll, it'll give you the stock data and this is on NASPERS, which of course is not, is not the, the uh, it's, a, it's not an American stock. So, uh, as a consequence, it wouldn't have as much information as the U.S. ones. But but look at that. I mean, there you've got you've got the the P/E ratio, uh, earnings per share, market cap 1.4 trillion rand, 438 million shares, and so on. Latest dividend, next dividend date. Uh, it's also got its competitors over here, and then financial ratios uh, the, on on the, these companies, South African companies. Lots of information that you would, all the information you could possibly want uh, from the balance sheet that you can get on the Wall Street Journal for South African companies. Of course, then when you start going into, we were talking a lot about Twitter, so you start going into the U.S. companies, it's just it's just all over. I mean, you 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 cannot uh, beat the data and the information as an investor that you can pick up from the Wall Street Journal. There's all the stories that come through. Uh, the stock data uh, research and ratings from what are analysts saying about it. They really are in a different league, these guys. So uh, I would strongly recommend if you don't, if you aren't already a, a subscriber to Biz News Premium, um, if only to get the Wall Street Journal. Uh, something like that.